Untamed. Five, four, three, two, one. The Platform. Hi, always it's Tony Sport, Martin Devin Lock and War. Three hours worth every afternoon on the platform. Got to download the app, the Platform NZ. It's on the App Store. If you want to subscribe to the Platform Platform Plus, then you can go back and listen to all of the live broadcasting we do every single day at your listening leisure. At your listening pleasure, it's not much. Keeps us all in gainful employment. Nine hours of free radio every day on the platform. This is a sports show. And the highlights of today's program including Mark Watson coming, Darren Baisley coming, talking toffees, Peter and Paul, a couple of real true blue Evertonian lads, and also HK Dub, the Takong Wong, because the rematch, the Super Bowl 57 rematch today, Chiefs hosting the Eagles. Are the South Africans really cricket's great chokers? Or is there another explanation for their continued failure at one-day World Cups? Added to that, Does that format even have a future anymore? Well, let's kick the podcast off attempting to answer that question. We begin the show the same way every day. That is, tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. Can one day cricket survive outside the World Cup? Let us go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. If the answer is no, and that's a big, fat, resounding no, then what is the question? The answer to that question, does One Day Cricket have a future outside of this quadrennial World Cup? For all the greatness of an interest in that tournament, the rest of it is only ever instantly forgettable. Ask yourself, when prior to the World Cup did we New Zealand last play One Day International Cricket? Who against and what were the results? I'll tell you, going back through the schedule the last 12 months, our team, the Black Caps, have in fact played 23 one-dayers, including two World Cup warm-ups. That's an average of a couple of months. We played India here, Pakistan there, India here, Sri Lanka here, Pakistan over there, England over there, and Bangladesh over there. Remember any of those? Of course you don't. The last one-day series that I can recall with any meaning at all was the Chapel Hadley series last August. And what I remember is a team of (laughs) giggly players laughing and joking on the sideline as Australia completely embarrassed us in Cairns or or Townsville or wherever it was. I only remember that because we never play Australia and I was looking forward to it so much and once again we got thrashed by it. The rest of it is meaningless. It's contrived, manufactured, it's games being played for game's sake. It's played to make up dates in the calendar to fulfil this future tours program schedule. There was a time in New Zealand when one day cricket actually did mean something, when matches counted. But nowadays, they don't. That's the truth. And the way the calendar is structured and the way that players are now choosing T20 franchise cricket above playing for their country, they won't become meaningful ever again. It is sad because you saw over the last few weeks, it's a great game. Well, it can be. The 50-over format still has legs. It can still be compelling. It can still hold you as an audience, and it can hold your interest over the duration of a tournament. But outside of that, outside of what we saw, outside of the World Cup, goodbye, one-day cricket, gone. The format is now the sport's dead duck. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Rock and sports news headlines. A wealth of them. Uh, well, I can't promise a wealth. I can promise a few. Mm-hmm. A fair few. Go on. I'll start off with rugby. And two coaches who were part of the All Blacks setup over the last, well, one of them over the last four years, the other one over the last two years, them being Joe Schmidt and the one and only Ian Foster. They have been linked with potential vacancies at Montpellier in France in the wake of an overhaul of management at that top 14 club. So Fozzie could be coaching in France. What do you reckon? No, I got him on the programme tomorrow. We're going to ask him that question. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Uh, Hannes Stratum, a player on South Africa's revered 1995 Rugby World Cup winning team, has died in a car crash. This being confirmed by the South African Rugby Union. Uh, He was 58 years of age. Very sad news. Uh, Former Wallaby Dan Herbert says uh, there will be no change to Rugby Australia's drive to integrate high performance across the country after he replaced Hamish McLennan as chair of the governing body in a boardroom coup. This is what Herbert had to say. There's a lot of admiration and respect for Hamish and what he's done (laughs) stepping into this seat when probably not many uh, people would have done it. 
I love these. I love it when he's out the door and you've got the position and you kind of, it's, it's kind of, well, there's a word for it, rubbing in. He's kind of like rubbing things in a little bit by no, no saying one, positive things. No he, one treads on anyone's he, grave. Look, I mean, even the worst politicians in the world, they will get a great eulogy, don't they, when they retire or when they die. Uh, the, the worst thing about that article, it's a great article by Jim Tucker, who we have on the program as well as a regular guest out of Australia, is the cheesy photos they always have of these guys. It's always, here, hold a rugby ball and look into the distance. You know, the Hamish McLennan and, and Mark Robinson with the, the, the pants rolled up and the walking in the sea holding a rugby ball bollocks. Well, they've got one of their Daniel Herbert on the on the front page of wherever, whatever organisation was printing that article in Australia. Same thing. You know, mm. Just come up with a different photo photographer. Uh, Daryl Mitchell uh, has been named in the ICC Team of the World Cup, uh, but Travis Head wasn't. He's been stumped from the team. Why is that? Not too sure. But anyway, here's the full uh, 12, t- uh, 12 man, 11 man team with a 12th man. Uh, Quinton de Kock from South Africa, Robert Sharma from India, Virat Kohli from India, Daryl Mitchell at four as well from New Zealand, KL Rahul from India, Glenn Maxwell, Australia. Ravi Jadeja, India, Jasprit Boom, Jasprit Boomerang, excuse me, from India, Dilshan Madhushanka from Sri Lanka, Adam Zampa, Australia, Mohammed Shami, India, and the 12th man, Jared Kutsi from South Africa. Um, how is Russian Ravindra not in there? Now, how but, is Travis Head not in there? But Daryl Mitchell is. Travis Head did the most for any team to win the well, tournament. I mean, to be fair, it was one game in the final. Well, he also played pretty damn well in the semi final. Sure, but that's two games out of 12. It's obviously for the whole tournament. Mm. Just curious to know how Daryl Mitchell... I mean, I love Daryl Mitchell. I have no problem with it, but how he's in there ahead of Russian Ravintra, who was just... It was second, third and run scoring. Well, I suppose that they put Coley in instead of him, didn't they? In that yeah, but you could put Richard at full. Or Coley at full. Well, Mitch got that, didn't he? But this is my point. <laughs> okay. um, this is why you... That, this is why you just imagine what it's like sitting around having these arguments trying to pick these teams, right? Uh, Southbees is set to auction off six shirts worn by Lionel Messi during Argentina's winning run at last year's FIFA World Cup in Qatar and uh, thinks they could uh, become the most valuable collection of sports memorabilia ever sold at potentially more than 16.6 million New Zealand dollars. Well, uh, for the time being, Bart, that's what's making news. Devian. Oh, my goodness me! The platform. All Whites tomorrow morning, 8.45 New Zealand time, playing the Republic of Ireland. Now, Ireland, this is the Republic side, have missed out on qualifying for the European Championships. They lost on the weekend to the Dutch 1-0. So I don't know what kind of team that they're going to front up with tomorrow. But more important than that, the All Whites, they got a front and we got to score a goal. Since he's been in charge, Darren Basie, seven matches. We drew with China. We beat China 2-1. We lost to Sweden 4-1. Qatar was cancelled because of the supposed racist insult. One all with the Democratic Republic of Congo. A 2-0 loss to Oz and recently a 2-0 loss to Greece. What does it take? to get this team, supposedly the best that we've ever had, the most talented squad on paper, playing like we want them to play, like we think that they should be playing. Darren. Do you feel that these guys are playing as well for you for New Zealand as they are for their individual clubs? Because that's a bit of a frustration. I mean, we've got what seems to be the most talented squad we've ever had on paper, but, you know, it's about delivering it, as you've been saying. Yeah, uh, no, you're right. We've got a really talented squad that's pretty young at the moment. Um, and like I say, I think when, when we say delivering, you know, we yeah, results-wise, we haven't had all the results that we wanted. But when you look back and, we, you know, we played against a, a lower-ranked team like a China, you know, there was positive results. Um, but, you know, when we're playing against the highly-ranked opposition, you know, that we have done with Australia and Sweden, you know, and even uh, Greece to an extent, or even though I felt like we, we matched Greece in lots of areas of the game, there's been lots of positive parts of the game. So, yeah, I mean, the next, uh, like, we, we don't we don't go into the games not trying to win. You know, the players are so competitive. You know, they try and win everything that they do. So we're going into these games trying to win, um, but it's not easy. You know, we're coming up against some really good teams and, and we're sort of, we're not doing the hard stuff, but we are picking games now that are challenging um, and more of a test than potentially some other fixtures where we could potentially, you know, have an easier time of it. But and like I say, I think playing all of these games um, will be great for us in the long run. We are very close to to getting positive results. Like I say, in, in each game, we've had some positive patches of play, some good moments. You know, we're starting to get into some really good areas. And, and we have got some good players that, you know, those those final moments will come. Darren Basis with us, All Whites coach. We play Ireland tomorrow morning, 8.45, kickoff New Zealand time. You're on the platform here. 
Danny Hay hasn't been involved since September last year. How much has changed since then? And also, like, what, what, what physically, what, what, what in reality has changed for you? Um, I mean, the players, obviously, the players are a year older. You know, they're more experienced within their clubs and we've had a lot of games. Um, so, I mean, yeah, every, every tour we get together, you know, there, there's an evolution and, and progression in regards to the culture and the playing style. You know, there was a really good base there. Um, you know, good, you know, the squad hasn't changed dramatically. Obviously, we've been lucky enough to bring in some younger players. But, you know, the squad hasn't changed that much dramatically from two years ago. Um, and like I say, we've just the more they spend together, the more time they spend together, the more they gel, the more they get cohesive, um, and the more that they build that understanding and connection with each other. So, so I think there's been you know some good progression made, you know, in, in regards to some of the style of play. Um, and obviously, what what doesn't get seen is how the boys are, you know, around each other. And you know, as we get towards these tough games over the next few years, you know, that'll all, uh, you know, I'm sure that's all going to come together at the right time. And right now, it's tough, you know, playing against Greece away, Republic of Ireland away, Sweden away, Australia, uh, in London. Um, you know, they're good. They're good games. They're good challenges. What what's really good now is we're getting regular games. Um, and we're getting a pretty consistent squad uh, that's featuring in all of those games, and they're, they're just going to get better and better. This, there's a really good team coming, um, and it's currently in that building phase. Like I say, most of the, the the majority of the squad are in that sort of younger younger part of their careers, or all now sitting on sort of 10 to 18 caps. Uh, and if we look ahead to potentially three years' time, you know, in those last few World, World Cup build-up games. You know, when, when we get there, you know, those guys are all going to be three years older. They're going to be 25, 26 years old, and they're all going to have 40 caps. So that's when this team's going to really be probably at its most effective. Two quick questions. I'll let you go. I know you, you, you've you obviously got, yeah, got got some others there. Um, plenty, plenty of time. Plenty we of time. were, you know, we we've been told that the camps have been pretty slack. And in Spain, before that Congo game, there was golf courses and casinos, and not many meetings. Is that right or not? <laughs> no, that's not right. Now, listen, we we stayed we stayed on a golf course. The hotel in Spain was on a golf course, and yes, the boys played some golf. But they're out there in the afternoon. We train in the mornings. They went out in the afternoon. Some of them, they've got a golf buggy, so they're they're in the shade. And, and that's what they do at home you know we don't we don't bring them away to put them in a prison camp you know we we you know, we want them to enjoy their own company each other's company um they're pretty respectful with how much golf they played and maybe only had two two games in a week in spain but like i say it's on it's right on our doorstep i haven't heard anything about a casino i know there wasn't one on the ho- in the hotel and as far as meetings go we uh i, I try Try my best to limit the meetings. You know, we're forever, you know, aware that we have a lot of meetings. You know, and yeah, I don't know where that's come from, but yeah, we we have we have potentially too many meetings because we're trying to cram so much information into that sort of week, ten days. So every day, you know, I could send you the schedules. Every day, there's, there's one or two meetings. We have a meeting for every training at a minimum, and then we've just literally come out of a meeting now. So there'd be two meetings a day pretty much most days uh, yeah I don't know yeah it's disappointing if you've if you've heard stuff like that but you know people talk and people have opinions but now we we definitely probably have too many meetings to hear the full interview download the platform at the app store via platform plus you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full it's time we need to talk Lachlan we got to play your favorite game which is what is more chance of happening? Said with enthusiasm and vigour. What is more chance what of happening? What is more chance of happening? Next. I present two scenarios and you're going to tell us what is more chance of happening. Mark Watson, the ATM podcast, episode 62, coming shortly. The All Whites score more than one goal versus Ireland tomorrow morning. Or the Football Ferns score more than one versus Colombia in their next friendly match. Colombia. What is more chance of happening? Now, they don't play for a while, I don't think, do they? Uh, Let's have a look. Uh, 3rd of December. Actually, that's soon. It feels like it's a while away. It's uh, just under two weeks away. Uh, What's more chance of happening? Uh, Probably the football fan scoring. What, more than once? Well, do you think the All White's going to score more than once against Ireland? Well, our last eight matches, I think we've scored four or five goals. But, yeah, I mean, we haven't looked lightly in the last couple... 
I mean, when do, the football fans just never look like scoring, do they? That's the thing. They just actually, that's true. Um, and apart from that goal against Norway, they haven't they didn't score anything in the World Cup. And since then, I don't know how much they've uh, played. Apologies, they've played uh, two games since then. Chile three 0 they lost. Chile two one they lost. I mean, they're both as bad as each other. Yes. What is more chance of happening there? And the All Whites do manage to put more than one, more than one, in back of Onion against the Republic of Ireland or South Africa. Break their one day World Cup hoodoo at the next World Cup in twenty twenty seven. Oh, come on, that's four years away. That's way too much of a hypothetical. Well, it's it's being played at home. South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia. Namibia have a cricket team? Well, they they, they certainly will by 2027 because <laughs> they're going to be hosting some one-day matches during that tournament. I mean, if it's based on the current format where only four go through. Yeah. Well, you said the semis anyway, excuse me. Um, so, wait, you're saying break their duck and get to a final? Yeah. No, that won't happen. No, won't okay. Happen. Yes! Right. Well, what Sorry. is more chance of happening then? The All-Whites put together some decent passing movements, score more that's, than... That's possible. More than one against the Republic of Ireland. Maybe not that, but... Or the Premier League punish Man City and Chelsea in the same way the that first they've, one, that they've just the slapped, first one that they've the all whites scoring more than one goal has more chance of happening than Chelsea and Man City receiving, based on fairness, as much a penalty as Everton. So what did Everton get? Uh, f- a two two million pound per point. Yeah, per, per, per point. Per point. Ten points for twenty million so point, pounds over. A point per. Uh, two million pounds. So if you look at Man City and the billions that they've spent, so how much are they over? They'll be playing, Take non, points they'll off. Be playing non-league football. They will next. be relegated into the fourth yes! or fifth league. Yeah. We're going to dig down deep into this after three o'clock. Uh, Talking Toffee's podcast. Peter and Paul, a couple of brothers who are just absolute lifelong Evertonians, and their reaction to it because it does seem so grossly unfair. Andy Buckley will join us with his expert opinion on it as yes! well. The All-Whites, what is more chance of happening that we score more than one goal against Ireland or the Breakers rebound and make the playoffs this year? Now, they've only got to make the top six. Oh, so that's got more chance of happening. I think it had. Look, last year, Breakers finished 18 and 10. Right now, we're three and seven. So to make the sixth place spot based on how the table ended last year, 15-13 was Southeastern Melbourne and Perth. So we'd have to go 12 and six from this point on to make fifth or sixth. Mm. So that's winning two out of every three games that we play from here on. No, I'd, I'd say there's more chance the Breakers make the finals than the All Whites scoring more than one it's goal tomorrow for the morning. It's a tough ask for the Breakers. Yeah, it's a very tough ask for the uh, for the All Whites okay, as well. All right, well, a couple yes! more to go. There's a lot of more chance of happening that the All Whites do do what you don't think that they will do, and they do score more than one goal versus Ireland, or someone other than Max Verstappen wins the Formula One next year. <laughs> See, mm, all whites take back those all whites. All whites yeah, well, what it relies on, look, at the start of last year, Ferrari had a quicker car, or at least were getting through their races uh, at a cleaner rate across the first four or five Grand Prix. But they cocked it up pretty much every single time based on really poor strategies, or Leclerc just, Charles Leclerc just, I don't know, taking himself out of the race randomly. They've been a lot cleaner in 2023 with their strategy, a lot better. They haven't had the pace to go with it. So if they could finally merge those two things, yeah, I actually think Charles Leclerc could win the championship next year. That's a huge if. That's got more chance of happening than the All-White scoring. No, th- no the All-White scoring than once, more than one goal more than tomorrow once morning against, against Ireland has more chance of happening than Max Verstappen not winning the title next yes! year. Final one then. Well, what does have more chance of happening? And again, Darren Basie will join us in about half an hour. The All-White's coach, 8.45 a.m. kickoff tomorrow against the Republic of Ireland. This is a team... That has failed to qualify for the European Championships next year. They lost to the Dutch 1-0 on the weekend, which means they could field a weakened team against us. So what is more chance of happening? That the All-Whites pop in more than one against them? Or as we will discuss after 3 o'clock, Bill Belichick is still the Patriots coach next year. Yeah, I'd say that's no, that's got more chance of happening. I would think that Bill Belichick will stick it. Because, look, because of the... Terrible form of the Patriots during the NFL two season so far. Moment. Two and eight. If he was to let go, even on his terms, it looks like a pushing out of the door. And he won't want that. The Patriots, but he especially won't want that to be the um, the look of him leaving the organisation. He got to leave of his own accord, didn't he? Yeah, but it's he's not, though, is he? He's leaving because the job's too tough for the team don't that, want him. But it's the PR spin that they put around yeah, but it. The thing is, if he sticks around for another year, I don't know, Retools the roster a bit, and it's there next year. 
Um, that's certainly plausible. I'd say that's got more chance of happening than the All Whites scoring two goals against Ireland. Do own goals counter says this texture? Of course they bloody do. I'll take an own goal against Ireland. Well, Dead. hold on. No, no, no. You what should have said that at the start. Matter. You can't do that. The platform. You've just changed the rules. You can't do that. That's what happens in life. It's weird, isn't it? And it's not fair, isn't it? But sometimes the rules get changed. I thought you were a nice teacher who wanted your students to perform well. Everton slapped by the Premier League and deducted 10 points for irregularities in their financial reporting. According to the financial fair play rules, regulations, this punishment meted out by the Premier League over the weekend. It seems so bloody harsh, doesn't it? You're allowed to spend a certain amount. You're allowed to overspend that by a certain amount. And they've gone over the certain amount amount by £20 million over about four years. And you get 10 points deducted for that. Well, Man City, remember, are facing 115 separate charges. Separate charges. Chelsea have spent more in the most recent transfer window than most clubs do in a century. What's going to happen to those two clubs? Talking Toffees podcast, Peter and Paul, a couple of brothers, a couple of true blue Evertonians joining us. First and foremost, um, so much empathy uh, your way. That punishment is just goddamn harsh. What A point for every two million bucks over. So what has been your immediate reaction to it? I think for, for me, Martin, um, first of all, as for the punishment itself uh, and Everton being punished, I've got no problem with it. Um, I've, I've read... Or trying to make sense of, of the notes of the out of the hearing and, and the outcome, and I, I understand and I've got no problems with Everton being punished, but it's the severity of the the, the punishment doesn't doesn't um, tally up w- w- with the the breach that's being committed. Uh, it just feels completely disproportionate and unfair, um, and without wanting to blame the victim, it it, it just feels. Very, very harsh on the fans, you know. I agree, Paul. If you feel the same way, I mean, you know, look. The first thing you think of is you think of the fans. You think of you guys who pay your ticket price every week, and that, and this is uh, misadministration by the club. But yeah, a hell of a punishment. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think I'd completely echo what Peter's just said there. To be honest, Martin, um, I feel the one thing we need to make clear is that Everton. Evertonians are not unhappy because we're being punished. Everton have broken the rules and they deserve to be punished for breaking them because they're in place for a reason and they need to be followed. What Evertonians are really staggered by is the severity and almost the unfairness of the um, of the sanctions themselves. Now, our, our, our club were told in the report that no sporting advantage was gained Everton fans, myself, Peter included, and a, a large number of Everton fans for so many years have campaigned about the mismanagement of Everton Football Club. We are all aware of how badly ran the club's been. And the fans have tried to highlight this for years and years. Now, the media that are now lining up to kick Everton in the stomach while they're down these are the same people who turned a blind eye for years when the Evertonians complained about the mismanagement. We were told uh, we were lucky to have such a wonderful chairman. I mean, Farhad Mashiri's had his criticism, but the board just seemed to get away with it. And Everton fans were, were told almost seemingly, you've got, you've got a good board, get on with it. I think for me... We deserve we we do deserve the punishments, but not ten points because that punishes the supporters. That punishes myself, Peter, our family, our friends. It punishes the players and Sean Dyche, who this season have worked extremely hard to turn around the stuttering start. And really, in the last few weeks, they've really shown themselves to be a very competent outfit. So it, it is frustrating. It's, it, it's a real blow, but I do feel that it won't affect Everton ultimately. I, I believe this season Everton will stay up. It put in no small thanks to the Premier League because I, I think what they've done this week is a disgrace, not in short, a disgraceful. Talking Toffees podcast, we've got Peter and Paul with us. Look, my mob come to your place next, and I know the atmosphere is going to be absolutely incandescent. It's going to be so difficult to get any kind of a result there because of it. But, Paul, just on that, 
You know, I think um, as a fan of another team other than Man City and Chelsea, I mean, we've all been sitting there over the last decade and more looking at, you know, the spend of these clubs. And I know my lot, Man United, have spent a hell of a lot of money. We earn a lot of money. But when you're charged with 115 separate breaches, you got away with it last time. When your two-year uh, punishment, which was out of Europe and everything else, was in cut in half, and then it goes to the Hague, and, of course, they chuck it out on a technicality, and we all just raise our eyebrows and go, well, is the same thing going to happen again? Because there does have to be equity here. You know, the, the only thing that's fair to make this fair, surely, is that they hammer Man City and hammer Chelsea. Well, I, I think that, that that's it, Martin, to be honest. Um, I think the Premier League are really panicking about the idea of an independent regulator coming in to um, monitor the Premier League, basically to make sure that they're not marking their own homework. Um, I think the Premier League, for a number of years now, have been trying to catch Manchester City out on... They've accused them of lying and manipulating figures financially. Um, but they haven't been able to sequester the evidence because Man City's lawyers, um, I, I mean, look at the money they've got. They can afford the best of, in the business. Their lawyers have just consistently put the blocks on any attempt to try and find out the information. Um, Chelsea, similarly, that the amount of money they've spent is obscene. Now, now, like myself and Peter, over the last six, seven years, we've watched Everton waste a hell of a lot of money We've spent well over £600 million on players, which is obscene, and, and I think the return we've had is very minimal. Chelsea have spent that alone in one transfer window, or almost, or certainly in one calendar year. So I think with the Premier League, they, as Peter alluded to, with the, the, the Super 6 breakaway with the Super League, they... If, if you're a club in that, in that six, I, I think you, you are treated differently. And, and this isn't me playing victim. It's always felt like there's two separate leagues. In the Premier League, there's the six who dictate financially, probably soon to be seven with Newcastle with the amount of money that they've got. And then there's the rest of us, the 14, 13 clubs. Um, we're, just, we're just left to pick up the pieces and carry on. I feel that the independent regulators... Have come in to try and try and identify, try and basically trying to help the Premier League do the jobs properly because they've done such a great job so far. And the Premier League, not for the first time with Everton, have made an example of us because we're an easy touch in their eyes and their commas. Um, and I've got to say, I've got to mention this as well. I feel this is important for your listeners for context. Myself. Peter, a number of Evertonians were very critical of Bill Kenwright, who's recently passed away. Very critical of his ownership. And even though the man passed away, the Premier League couldn't wait even 24 hours to leak to the press. The Everton were the Premier League were going to suggest the strongest possible points deduction. The man hadn't even been dead for 24 hours and the Premier League were briefing that to the press. So it's it's got to a point where it is what it is with, with the Premier League. It's felt like, I know every fan feels like this with VAR, it just feels like the, the Premier League have a massive agenda against Everton Football Club. And that's fine, they can make an example of Everton, but they've picked the wrong fan base <laughs> to... Um, to to have it to bring this up with and unfortunately Martin for you I think Manchester United are going to feel the wrath of that on Sunday here we are the tight five five separate sporting topics lock and we'll whip through them quickly because when the bell goes we have another topic to talk about Chiefs at Eagles you'll be much looking forward to this Darren Baisley we're about to talk to the All Whites we're going to score a goal tomorrow what do you want from the All Whites coach um, if a guy messages a girl on her birthday and she replies, thank you, with an exclamation mark, what does that mean, Lachlan? You should know. Does one day cricket have a future outside the World Cups? North Macedonia versus England today, speaking about football. Let's kick that. North Macedonia, uh, they aren't rubbish at all. They knocked Italy out of the qualification places for the World Cup in Qatar. It was a one-all draw today. 
But that England side is just such a reflection, as I was talking to Watto on the coach, Gareth Southgate, who is a very boring man and plays very boring football, and the side just seems so constrained and confined. Well, they, that's they do, just, yeah. It's the truth. You've got so it? many talented players up front and in the midfield who never do anything. Never do anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Grealish, yeah. Foden, Jaden Sancho, who's been a pop at Man United, but he's a talented player. Well, you're Marcus, Marcus Rashford. Rashford as well, yep. Again, Harry not, Kane coming off the bench Harry, today. Harry Kane scored. Why didn't he start? 63 goals in 89 games for Harry Kane. Is he their greatest ever striker? Well, by the numbers, yes. By the numbers, he is, yeah. Ooh. I mean, Bobby Charlton, I think, is a better player, or was a better player, and I actually think Wayne Rooney was a better player, but Harry Kane's got too, the numbers. I do too, but by the numbers. Yeah, but how long can England sustain this? I mean, you know, as Watto says, oh, they've made the semis, they've made the final, they've done this, but they've never looked like winning those competitions. They kind of get to that stage, and then they just clam up. They should have won the Euros. Or a better team than Italy, I thought. Last year, remember, they crapped out against France, France and Harry Kane missed that penalty in about the 80th minute. Darren Baisley, what do you want from the All Whites coach and what do you want from the All Whites tomorrow against Republic of Ireland, mate? Well, go forward. Exciting play. Something that shows you actually are there to play some football instead of play so conservative. Because I saw bits and pieces of the most recent game and it was exactly how you described it yesterday. Just turning around and passing, passing back to the backwards. goalkeeper. Yeah. Yeah, we do, back we, to the defenders. Yeah, we do the U. We pass from the left back all the way back There's to no the centre back. And they, 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 we just there needs to be some ambition in the way we play. And these are players who are all professionals who are playing in professional leagues and they may not be at the, at the absolute height of those countries that they play in. It's like it's not Premier League. We've only got a couple of one of those, but the rest, you know, they're still playing, getting paid to play and they mm. should be playing for the national team a lot better. We're rocking through because we are about to talk to Mackenzie Barry. Chiefs at Eagles, repeat of the Super Bowl. 38-35, it was. You know this. You don't need to bring it up again. 27-21 to you guys after three. They Come won on. the last quarter 17-8. Stop it. Are you going to win this game in I Kansas? I think we are. I think we are. We're coming off the bias. We've had a week off. Mm-hmm. We're 8-1 and one and we are a yeah. fraudulent 8-1 and one team. We haven't been playing well. No, I, I disagree with that. In the NFL, there's no such thing as that. No, no, no. Every no, no, single no, no, game no, no, you no, no, win. No, 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 Every no. game you win. They've been tight games, jammy. We've turned the ball over. Our defense has saved us, but our offense, I, has, it just hasn't looked as good as what we were last year. So you don't no, I, 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 best football we're now, not. Right? I, I didn't think we're an eight to one team. Well, you're eight to one on the scoreboard. That, I'll take that. We take. We're yeah, well, even seven. anyone would. But this is a game. I think we circled on the calendar in pre-season. We want to go and beat the Super Bowl chance. The team who beat us in the Super Bowl. We want to go to their backyard and do it. And I think we care about this game much more than they do. Is Tay Tay going to be there? Stop it. Is Tay Tay going to be there? I don't care. You do care. No, I you don't. Will, you do. I'm so <laughs> sick of it. I'm one so day sick of it. cricket. Does it have a future outside the World Cups, Lachlan? Tell me it does. But I just can't see how it does. Well, no. You've got Test Cricket, which services the traditionalists and maintains the history of the sport. And then you've got T20 Cricket, which is where the money is. Or franchise T20 Cricket, where the money is. So those two will be fine. And then it's just kind of this... One that's longer than T20, but it's sh- a lot shorter than Test cricket. And it's been it's... the bastard child for a number of years now, hasn't it? Eh? It has. I mean, the World Cup's great, but even then, I mean, a T20 is still three hours, three and a half hours, and then a one day is like seven, eight hours. Like it's it's it, like I think Test cricket is the only form that can get away with being so long because of just the history attached to it. Do you think it's a shame? I do. I used to love one day cricket. It is a shame. Nice it was great it. when I'd be working on the news desk and would have a one day of starting at 11 a.m. or something like that. Yeah. That was great. All day. Um, but has time know. just moved on? I think so. Kid, kids don't enjoy seven, eight hour there sports games. Time and the audience have moved on, ladies and gentlemen. Devlin. Yes! Yes! Can we do it? The platform. Does one day cricket have a future? Look, you look at the World Cup and you think, yeah, I like that tournament. I like the way that the tournament. Has a game every day. There's always something on. You can sit and watch it all night. I know it takes a hell of a long time, but that's cricket, isn't it? And if you've grown up used to cricket, well, one day cricket's always had a huge part and a place in our sporting calendar. But does it anymore? Because the players don't want to play it, do they? It's not T20 franchise hit and giggle crack hand. Outside of the World Cups, mm. are we going to see any meaningful one day cricket? Mark Watson, the ATM podcast. We have played, Mark, at this 21 ODIs in the last year previous to the One Day World Cup. Can you name any of, can you name any of those series? 
I mean, look, we actually played England in four of them before the World Cup. They're just so forgettable, aren't they? And this is where I worry about it. Like, where does it fit into the schedule? You've got all these meaningless T20 tournaments, which are franchise tournaments, which nobody cares about. You've got a test cricket calendar, which is thoroughly reduced now to just individual series between countries like India, maybe South Africa, England, Australia. And, and where does the rest of it fit? And we played two tests. And I mean, you know, tell me when, when we did last and who were they against. And no one can remember any of this stuff. The one-day cricket tournament comes around every four years. It's bloody brilliant to watch while it's there. But then what happens in the meantime? No, exactly. Exactly. Cricket's got a real crisis. And I blame the Indians and the BCCI for much of this. I think they've hijacked the game. I think it was Mark Butcher, the former English player, that said, look, the ICC now really is just, you know, it, it, it's just an office for the BCCI. Um, it's a subsidiary of them. And as I said, the only people that are making any real money in this and benefiting from it are the players. And, and I've had that same discussion around rugby in this country. And it's because you've got a billion people in India and that subcontinent who allow for the commercial side of it. And, and as I've always said, I felt, you know, with a lot of these professional tournaments, there's probably a level of money laundering or some sort of level of financial skullduggery going on, which props these things up. But that's just the way the economy, that's just the way the culture is in that part of the world when it comes to the business side of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, when we were growing up, Martin, I mean, our, our black caps for our New Zealand cricket team, they were just such familiar faces. They were... You know, well, they were as big as the All Blacks. We knew who they matches, were over the summer period. They were appointment very. I mean, I can vividly remember series back from the 80s, from the 90s, you know, yeah. and, and these matches really, you felt like they, they actually meant something. These days, yeah, it's all just, the cricket calendar is just such mumbo jumbo trying to figure it out. But when you go back through how many matches the Black Caps have played in, in, in uh, white ball cricket over the last year, it's just extraordinary. The only thing is you can't, none of them stay with you. No, and they're all meaningless. And I think what cricket's tried to do now is bring in this ranking system where he's the number one one-day bowler in the world, number one one-day batsman in the world. It's like, really? Really? I mean, I think it was um, was it Kyle Mills who I think years ago was given the number one one-day bowling ranking in the world. And it's like, no offence to Kyle, mate, but you're not the best one-day bowler in the world. You're just not. The Australians would not put you in their team. And so they're looking for other ways of somehow trying to prop this up, trying to create some interest. But you're right. If, if the New Zealand cricket team loses these days a one-day game, the nation doesn't wake up no, the next day and no, warn. No. no one gives a damn. Talkback doesn't go off anymore. And, and there again, there's no jeopardy. There's no meaning to any of it. And look, even at a test match level here in New Zealand, I mean, what have we, who have we got coming up over summer? Pakistan again? No, I think we've actually I mean, got South Africa. I think England come here. But again, I mean, look, it all just floats under the radar. But exactly. But we, we, we don't know, though, do we? No, we, we don't <laughs> And that's part of the, that's part, of, but that's part of the television issue too, where they took it away from mainstream television and put it on a platform, and so we suddenly started to lose interest, um, almost almost by default, or not necessarily through our own intent. But the fact that we can't sit here and name exactly what test matches are coming up is the well, point of what we're yeah, actually yeah, talking exactly, about. Exactly what I, I mean, the, the most compelling cricket I've watched. It, it was still the Ashes. Yep. That's yeah. all I'm looking forward no, to now. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to England turning to Australia in a couple of years' time. That's all I'm looking forward to. And the only other games I'm interested in is India when they play away from home and see whether or not they can be beaten away from home. There's no point watching them play at home because they win everything at home. Let's talk about Aussie just quickly, though. Aren't they incredible, that bunch of cricketers? Doesn't matter who they put in. Doesn't matter, you know, whoever wears the cap, whoever pulls, you know, the canary yellow on. When it comes to one-day cricket, mate, six wins in the last nine tournaments, Mark, five of those away from home. I mean, those are stats that the All Blacks should have, that we want the All Blacks to have, and that we don't have. Well, they're just ruthless, the Australians, aren't they? I mean, they are a bunch of mongrels, most of them, in terms of some of the conduct and stuff. But, boy, there is an edge to them. They have a legacy. They have an expectation. Um, you know, look, there's probably some argument that we are a bit too nice at times and maybe we need to be a little bit more like the Aussies. But they've just got depth. They've just got quality, haven't they? They've got legacy. And don't underestimate that, that, you know, one generation inspires the next generation or places an expectation yeah, on the current it. generation. Oh, and I think that's what you're seeing. Yep. Um, yeah, do I like the David Warners? Do no, I like the way they conduct no, themselves? Hate no, them. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot stand Same. them, mate. Cannot yeah. stand them. Yeah. But they know how to win, don't they? And the Australians love them. Again, jumping up and down, another sense of nationalism written off. But when it's all said and done, they find a way of winning, don't they? And you've got to admire them for it. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, maybe South Africa. Are they chokers? Look, I, I, I don't think so. I just don't think... Um, you know, as we talked about, one day cricket's fickle. I mean, New Zealand, what are we, four or five consecutive semi finals now? We've been in two, we've lost two. 
Uh, South Africa no more chokers than we are. Um, they just simply don't have the depth. And yeah, it'd be you know history says that look, it's the one big tournament South African sport haven't won. But I'll argue that you look at how much coverage cricket's had in this country over the last hundred years, and I think we've won officially one ICC tournament, haven't we? So. Um, yeah, we're no different. And I, I still say this about New Zealand cricket. You, you know, we're the great underachievers of New Zealand sport. They are still the great underachievers of New Zealand sport. Yes, they provided us some moments, but they still actually haven't won anything. The greatest moment in New Zealand cricket for me was the Test Series victory over Australia in 1985. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. NFL, the Super Bowl, 57 earlier this year, and the Chiefs squeaked it past the Eagles by three points. Well, the rematch of that was this afternoon at Arrowhead, where Taylor Swift rocked, and then Travis Kelsey got in touch with her because he wanted to rock her and show her how much he rocks at the place that... I'm going to get in real trouble if I continue with this, aren't I? HK Wong at Football Garbage Time, at FB Garbage Time, Twitter handle. He's our man talking NFL. We're at halftime, 17-7, repeat of the Super Bowl. And is this another Chiefs benefit match, is it, HK? Uh, well, you know, I mean, this is one of those things that uh, is still up in the air. It's only halftime, just plenty more to go. Uh, Lots of things to uh, kind of come into the front forefront here, though. It's really interesting. Okay, well, tell us what your takeaways are. These are the two things I've been writing down. I'm only seeing it out of the corner of my eye here, but both touchdowns for the Chiefs. The first was 10 plays. Uh, 80 yards, 543, and I think the next one was seven plays and about 50, if not 60 yards. So on the ground, uh, just before halftime, there were 121 rush yards, which is a season high for the Eagles' defence letting those rush yards come. So how significant those stats mm. I've just run by you? No, very significant. In fact, that's the first thing I noted is the ground game differential between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles. And why is this important? It's important because both defenses are good and the weather. It's, it's sloppy, wet weather. There's lots of rain. Wind is blowing sideways. It's not terrible, but it certainly is going to impact the ability to pass the ball. So the fact that they have an advantage, 121 yards, as you mentioned, versus only 58 yards by the Philadelphia Eagles, typically really good at moving the ball on the ground. That's a problem. And if you look at the yards per carry, also a significant story there, 6.1 yards per carry for the Kansas City Chiefs, 5.3 for the Eagles. You know, the fact of the matter is that the Kansas City Chiefs keep ramming it down their throats and running these sweeps. They can do that all day. They can do that all day at 6.1 yards per carry. They will make it down there almost every single time. So certainly very significant, particularly in the weather conditions they were looking at, and particularly at these types of defenses that are on both sides of the ball. Can anyone beat this Chiefs side if they stay healthy? Because I'm thinking that throughout the playoffs, they're going to have home advantage. How goddamn hard is it to go and win there? I know that you know teams have in the past. I think Joe Burrow did it to them, didn't? But I mean, how difficult? And that means right. that they would go to the Super Bowl again. I mean, who can actually beat them? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that it depends because on their home field, they have, a, like I said, a significant advantage. It has to be a cold weather playing team. So maybe somebody like the Baltimore Ravens can't go in there and derail this because they are a very strong run first team. They have three great running backs if they're healthy, of course. And of course, Lamar Jackson can run as well. So, I mean, if having that, being able to control time of possession, being able to control the ground game, they can grind one out against the Kansas City Chiefs. The only other way to beat them is to have a high-powered high flying offense, sort of like Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. We know that can't happen anymore with Joe Burrow out for the yeah. season with a wrist injury. Uh, Lachlan, you're going to love this next bit. You know what's coming, Lachlan, but Travis Kelsey scored a touchdown, which means that there is going to be one I'm fan not in Argentina at the moment, HK. He is interested. I'm not interested. The, the, the Tay Tay Trey Trey <laughs> stats, HK. We can't ignore this now. Is he having the best season he's having because of her? Well, I think he's having. The, so listen, he doesn't even have to be playing ball. He has the best season of his of his, of his life because he has her. All right, he doesn't even have to be playing. I agree. He could be retired yes. and be having the best yes. season of his life yes. by having yes. Taylor yes. Swift. Yeah, and look, it's a bit different from when. I mean, I always used to laugh about David Beckham because every time he got into his car, Posh Spice would be trying to play her CD and it just must have been, oh my God, she's playing her bloody music. <laughs> Whereas at least with Taylor Swift, I mean, she's got, what, a thousand different songs and so forth. And, you know, he can Fair. just say, play, play that album, play that album. Lachlan, you love this. Tell him you love this. You're warming to this, aren't you? It's part of the commentary. Oh, it's part of the narrative, is. man. No. I'm not. He's I mean, fighting look, it, man. He's fighting it, HK. That was a reluctant no. Yeah, the, only, the, only positive, the only positive about any of this is that I've got a full leg, multi, and one of them was Travis Kelsey getting a touchdown. 
So I'm looking well, all right. Well, they would have been paying oh, a dollar too. <laughs> Good God. I mean, of course he's going to well, get no, a touchdown. Well, no, that's four legs and it's paying $11. Right. I put down 10 <laughs> so I get 110 <laughs> There we go. That's what, I, that what, that's, what's, that's what makes me happy about Tay-Tay. That's it. HK, you talk to a lot of <laughs> NFL fans. Are people, are people liking the story? Are they sick of it or are they over it or what? Uh, you know what? The funny thing is that most traditional NFL fans like to say they hate it, but they don't, Marty. They don't hate it. Nah. They love it because you want to know why you have more NFL fans. And the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of people out there who probably are in relationships where they're like, you know what? Hey, watch this football game with me. No, thank you. Oh, wait, Taylor Swift is there. All right, I'll sit oh, on down. Yeah, okay. So listen, yeah, you know, I think there's a, whatever brings more fans to the table. Yeah. Whatever brings more eyes on the league is a positive. I don't care if it's Taylor Swift or Travis Kelce or, you know, the boogeyman. It doesn't matter to me. Somebody get there and get more eyes on. That's a big benefit for everybody. NFL fans love to hate her, but they love her. We know it. Finally, then, I mean, we're watching this game. And I love it and I hate it at the same time because these are two good teams playing what the NFL should look like as opposed to when you sit down in front of your team and I sit down. I mean, I watched the game again last <laughs> night when I got home. It's not NFL, mate. I mean, well... No. Throwing six picks and the other team, that, that, that's not football. Yeah, no, we, we need to have some kind of relegation system where we take our go teams on. and relegate them down to some other level. Maybe we can go, you know, no offense to the Canadian footballers, yeah, but, yeah. you know, maybe we relegate ourselves down to the Canadian Football League or something, and maybe you and I can win a championship that way. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, Download the Platform app and via Platform Plus you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do though is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.